My name is Ray Lutz. I'm with Citizens Oversight. We're here at the Laguna Hills Community Center in Laguna Hills. This is Southern California. We're a few miles north of the San Onofre nuclear power plant, which shut down in, in January 2012. It's been a bit over five years. And at this point, they're trying to go through rapid decommissioning. They want to decommission and tear down the plant as fast as possible so they can get the money out of the decommissioning trust fund as quickly as possible. This nuclear plant now, they're looking for where to put the waste. We got 3.6 million pounds of high level, extremely deadly nuclear waste that you can't even get near or you will get, um, you know, you will get radiation sickness and may die. Uh, you certainly don't want to dilute it into the water of the ocean because then you will be, uh, you know, probably making this whole coastal area the Southern California coastal area, which is home to the top surfing areas of the world. They're really, really nice beaches up and down the coast. These will all be decimated by a radioactive release if it happens. What happened was Southern California Edison was given the job of deciding where to put this 3.6 million pounds of waste. They're a for-profit corporation. Their only interest in life is making this as cheap as possible and getting to please their shareholders with their new stock price in the next quarter. That's their interest and that's about all you, they're good for. And we're trusting them to make a decision for the public and the public's interest that'll be good for the next 25,000 to 250,000 and some isotopes have a half-life of 9 million years. So to trust a for-profit corporation to make those sort of decisions is a little bit outlandish but that's the way it's happening so what did they decide to put this nuclear waste dump only a hundred feet from the water and only inches over the high level water mark of the salt water of the ocean this is such a ridiculous place and what happened was when the public started to see from the google satellite view pictures of where this was and how close it was to the precious ocean ecosystem, they started to just blow their top. The thing went viral around the internet looking at this, this view of where this is going to be. And the citizens have to rise up here and say no to this ultra ridiculous place for the nuclear waste and, and force them to move it to another place. Now our position, Citizens Oversight and Mikey Geary in this settlement talks, is that we do not want this thing built on the coast at all. I know they're in the process of building it. They set the big enclosure canisters out there and you can see it on Google satellite view. For anybody that wants to zoom in to San Onofre, you'll see it there. Even though they have those there, they haven't poured the concrete yet. But if they do, and if they ever load it with anything, they're going to have radioactive concrete, radioactive steel, which then has to be disposed of in another radioactive waste dump. So we don't want to build any more of these and we absolutely have to because it just gets into more and more of this waste that then we have to take care of. The goal is to have experts involved and to find out a good place for, for the waste. Hi, thank you. Um, it's great to be here in your beautiful part of the world. I spent the morning walking on the beach right by the nuclear reactor and I understand fully and totally concur that this is the wrong place for radioactive waste to be stored for all eternity. Um, I'm from Texas. I'm Karen Haddon with Seed Coalition. And in Texas, we're getting dumped on as well by the nuclear industry. We've got two proposed sites that are on the Texas-New Mexico border where they want to bring the radioactive waste from the whole country. And what we're asking is that for folks here to please consider that people there do not want the waste and do not want consolidated waste. At these sites, there's an effort to get the waste to stay there for 40 years to 100 years. And if that happens, there will never be a permanent repository. We know Yucca Mountain failed, but it would be good if this country would develop a permanent repository and, and one that's actually safe and viable. Um, I brought with me some pictures that are from the people in Andrews that are very close to where this waste would be, and I'll be happy to share these with you. It's an area, there are people that live there. A lot of times the nuclear industry is telling people, oh, nobody lives there. No, they live there, and they, um, 
have a very beautiful community and a lot of emphasis on family life there. It's very wonderful and loving community. Um, there's about 15,000 people in Andrews County. Nearby in New Mexico, Eunice, New Mexico is five miles away. So what all of us are asking is that while these decisions are getting made, um, we, don't, we hope that waste won't be shipped farther than it has to. We understand the need to get it off the coast. Um, sea level rise is real and it's just not the right place. But we would urge that waste not be sent unnecessarily to a storage site and instead that waste be moved only once to a real permanent repository if and when that can be determined. Thank you. I, I was at a uh, Coastal Commission hearing this morning speaking at uh, the public comments. It was not an agendized item, the fuel, but uh, what it felt like, it felt like all the other meetings that I've attended regarding anything nuclear, which is the entire public discussion, the pi entire public discourse is controlled uh, by Edison and the NRC. Federal preemption prevents us from talking about any of the safety issues. But I think the, uh, the, the, the clear thing to know when we talk about the fuel here is that we had an accident in 2011 in Fukushima, Japan. We invited the Prime Minister here to speak in California, San Diego at the administrative center, county administrative center in San Diego. And in the, the conference was titled Fukushima Lessons for California. And the Prime Minister made it very clear. He said, when we were in the early days of that disaster, I spoke to my nuclear experts and we were putting together plans to evacuate, permanently evacuate Tokyo, the largest city in the world, a city of metropolitan area the greater Tokyo area is over 50 million people. And he said, if I evacuated Tokyo, we would have lost Japan as a viable nation. That's what the fuel means. If we understand when we talk about fuel and canisters and we talk about placing it on the beach, we need to understand what, what are the consequences of losing control of the fuel? Well, losing control of the fuel is, is equivalent to losing something the size of California. Japan at the time was the second largest economy in the world when their prime minister was anticipating essentially abandoning the country because of loss of the fuel. So when Edison says it's safe, or you see pictures of it 100 feet from where children and dogs are playing on the beach, you realize this thing is, this whole situation is so out of control um, that we need to inform the public, we need to inform elected officials, we're so far off base. He drove north and stopped at San Onofre and he saw how close the facility is to the highway and he couldn't believe that there was a public recreational beach in front of the power plant. Other Japanese uh, that were accompanying him said, do these people have any idea what that plant emits? I said, no, they have no idea. In fact, Edison's telling everybody that it's safe. And th their, their response was, my God, oh my God. So here we are tonight. This isn't even this is this isn't even a decision making body. And the fuels it's been decided by the Coast Commission they can't do anything now. Edison told them what they have to do. Fuels on the beach indefinitely and unretrievable, unmonitored. Edison's backed off of all the emergency planning for all of us around the power plant. And yet the power plant's storing several Chernobyl's worth of radiation essentially on a public beach here in Southern California. So thank you for everybody coming out and supporting this issue. It's, it's amazing how quiet it, this issue is, but I want to say when we put together this conference, Gary and, and uh, Lori and a number of other people were involved in putting that together. We called in every news agency to cover it. We had a lot of news agencies there, but there was almost no coverage on TV. For some reason, that coverage wasn't broadcast. We don't know why, but we had also with the former Prime Minister of Japan, we had the former Chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission that was there, and we had another U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission Commissioner, Peter Bradford, who was on the commission during the Three Mile Island disaster. And all these men were there to try to speak wisdom to the decision makers 
that we're anticipating restarting San Onofre upwind of all of us. It's important that we all know that we are all downwinders out about uh, at least 160 miles. That's what the Prime Minister was looking to evacuate out. Losing control of the fuel meant evacuating out 160 mile radius. That's down to Ensenada and it's up to Oxnard. And it's out, it's out far east of here towards the border with Arizona. That's, that's what a fuel accident means. Um, this push is very important because I think the way that the fuel has been left now, um, Edison schnookered everybody and they've dumped this fuel on us. And they've dumped it in a configuration where there may not be any way to get it out of here. So we're trying hard, everything we can do, to convince the Coastal Commission that they actually have the button to push to stop this, which is to revoke that license to allow it to be stored here in a configuration that's non-retrievable, non-transportable, in casks that are only guaranteed for, I believe, 25 years. Um, the fuel, we, got, we have to babysit this fuel for the next tens of thousands of years. In other words, I have my whole family's here in a van here. They, I brought them up here. It's my son's birthday. <coughs> We've been doing this for years, Gary. It's my son's birthday. We should have a crowd a thousand times bigger than this. If you love Southern California, if you love the coastline, if you love your lifestyle, if you love your property, if you don't want to face personal financial ruin from an industrial accident on the beach, get the word out. Talk to your elected officials. Get people tuned into this. Educate, educate people around you about what's going on right now. This is one of the biggest schnooker jobs ever. Almost inconceivable that this is happening. <laughs> Ray and, and uh, an attorney, Micah Gary, are doing a tremendous job challenging this decision to put it on the beach. This guy's a hero in California. You, you should see this man speak, if you haven't already. <clears throat> this guy speaks truth to power like nobody else. Um, we need to pull in more elected officials to hear his speech, to understand the lawsuit that's going on right now at the Coastal Commission, uh, to revoke that license. Um, I just hope that we all prevail in this. I hope enough people get on board. I, I hope enough people understand what's at stake here. Um, uh, yes. Well, you know, it, it's a great question because I think we all have been told that this stuff is totally safe. The power plant was safe. The fuel is safe. Don't worry, be happy. But when Fukushima had its accident, the truth was revealed, which is the true insidious nature of this fuel when it goes bad, when it, when it, when it overheats. It catches fire, the cladding catches fire, and it releases particles of radioactive particles into the environment that travel any direction the wind is going, and you can't put these fires out. And so as the contamination comes down, it's, it's, it's highly radioactive contamination, so you're forced to abandon your property. There's, there's a lawsuit that occurred in the past over at San Onofre and re reactor number one had a fuel failure. The fuel failure released what are called fuel fleas or, or they're, they're, they're tiny particles of fuel that were released into the, into the uh, reactor building. Uh, fuel flea if inhaled, they're, they're statically charged particles. If you inhale a fuel flea, you're dead. It'll eventually kill you. It's a, it's a rare cancer, it's a, it's a painful death, and it's quick. Fuel fleas travel like dust. When you have an accident, it just releases metric tons of this stuff in the form of fleas like dust that travel hundreds of miles downwind. Actually, at Fukushima, they were picking up the radiation a couple of weeks after the, the explosions in monitors on the west coast of the United States and all the way across the continent and later on in Europe. These are big accidents. And depending on the concentration or the, or the level of radioactivity, you may be forced to evacuate your property and never return. That's what's happened in Japan. I think people don't understand that that's what this fuel means when it goes bad. The heart and soul of this industry was not clean power too cheap to monitor. The heart and soul of this industry was really production of fizzle material to create bombs. <coughs> that idea became uh, atoms for peace and wound up becoming a nuclear power industry and. California, but when you look, drive down the coast highway, 
I mean, the, the, the five freeway, and you look at those domes and you look at the spent fuel pools in front of them, what you're really looking at is a Cold War relic based on an idea that, that we should create a system, a weapon system large enough to take out entire cities. And we've been left with a fuel that is capable of doing that in its, in its spent fuel form if you have a fire. And that's what we're confronting now is this kind of the tail end of the Cold War. And we're told to just grin and bear it. Thanks, Rick. I just want to share the personal side of what this story is about, because I was just as unaware as everyone else about this issue. So few people know as much as some of the people you just listened to that I wouldn't know that we were in danger if it hadn't been for brave people working in the nuclear power plant coming to us as anonymous sources to let us know what's wrong with the steam generator project. And lo and behold, two years later, everything they said came true. We had all kinds of resistance and naysayers and blaming us for you know, being fear mongers. But it was true. And it was a very hard lesson to learn just as an average citizen to get thrown into this mess. But besides learning that this industry is not to be trusted, that they will lie to us because of profit motives. That's kind of understood more widely in the public, but what's not understood is there's very honest, real scientists out there that will stake their lives on their claims. They care much more about the earth and other people than any you know, business associated with a for-profit motive. And we learned so much from the nuclear experts that came in to, to explain to us what was going on with the steam generator project. They were right. We should listen to them again. And that's why I'm here tonight is to emphasize that we know we can see the problems, but we can't see the answers very clearly. And we're hoping that through raise efforts and negotiations that we're going to get uh, just the highest class scientists and engineers to tell us how do we how do we do this to make ourselves safe during the period where we know this wake has to stay here just long enough to cool decades and then we have to know that when it goes to somewhere like where Karen lives that we haven't sent them a dangerous problem we have to think this all the way through for years and years and understand that we're going to do the best we can the the least worst solution is about all we can hope for because they've stuck us with a horrible problem and the only way we're going to get out of it is staying together fighting against the corruption that's going on behind the scenes and making something like this a reality that they're about to put you know hundreds of times of more radiation than chernobyl right on the shoreline in an earthquake tsunami zone it's just the worst case you could ever imagine and we're here to stop that. We kind of come up with a better idea and listen to the experts that we can trust because these guys aren't trustworthy, sorry to say. Uh, there's a lot of good people in there, but they have different motives than we, uh, we have. We're, we're, our objective is to do the right thing for the greater good and hope that we succeed in that. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. You know, Gary has been uh, really working this for years in this area and, and I have to take my hat off to Gary for really doing the groundwork up here more than uh, I don't know anyone else for the most part uh, for the longest period of time so thank you Gary for all that and, and Laura too so what we yeah thank you let's give him a hand it takes a lot of work and especially tenacity to, to do this for the number of years that it takes to actually stick it out. And that's what really is, is difficult. So again, we're saying no to the nuclear waste dump on the beach. No nuke dump. Okay, we want it to be not on the beach. We know that it has to be somewhere, but we want them to do the hard work of figuring out where it needs to be. That's the reason for the lawsuit by Citizens Oversight to put a stop to it. We're now in settlement talks. We're about to go into uh, getting the experts, as Gary said, together and working out uh, a settlement, we hope. The next court date is July 14th. That's when we're supposed to come back with a result from the settlement talks. I can't go into detail about what the talks are doing so far, but our goal is to not let them go through with this ridiculous decision that they made. 
the for-profit corporations that we put our trust in to make the decisions for the society uh, for potentially tens of thousands of years and they're only interested in the stock price variations for the next day or the next quarter and this doesn't work so that's why we need to get together as a community to make sure that they do the right thing okay thanks you very much and that'll be the end of the press conference go in hear what they have to say and then make your comments at about uh between 7:30 and 8:30, we get an hour thanks again